Miller, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. We here at the Island University are thrilled to host today's event, and we are very proud to be part of what we are certain will become a booming industry for the Coastal Bend and for the state of Texas. I do want to remind everyone to make sure that you remain muted, otherwise we'll have a lot of static, uh, but we would very much appreciate uh, you keeping yourself muted and only when you speak would you unmute and we'll keep that to our speakers today so that everyone can listen and enjoy the event. Now, when we talk about oyster mariculture, I think that Representative Hunter said it best when he said, and I quote, oyster mariculture and its impact on the Texas seafood industry presents the opportunity for not only thousands of new jobs, but for the creation of an entire new industry that will foster economic growth, add to the quality of life, and enrich the coastal surroundings. This groundbreaking new oyster initiative was championed in the last Texas legislative session by Representative Hunter and the overwhelming bipartisan support that House Bill 1300 received would not have been possible without his leadership and without the strong collaborative partnerships that existed between our world renowned Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies, our researchers in the College of Science and Engineering, as well as local businessmen and women, restaurateurs, surfers, and conservationists that all came together to make this possible. So today, we are looking forward to building on the ideas that were developed in the inaugural Oyster Mariculture Summit held on our campus last year. And it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce everyone's favorite man in black, State Representative Todd Hunter. Thank you, Dr. Miller, and I, and I want to thank you and Texas A&M, University of Corpus Christi for being with us all the way and bringing back the Texas Oysters. So thank you a lot. And the conference we had at your campus uh, last year was great and excellent. So thank you all for being there. And, you know, I wanna shout out to a lot of people that are watching and listening. We have a lot of folks here today that were part of the team to bring that Texas Oyster back. So thanks for everybody being involved. Now, right at the top, I need to make sure everybody knows that this symposium conference is being recorded. So everything you see, everything that is said is being recorded and we wanna make sure that everybody knows that. So again, this is being recorded. Let me just make some general comments, but we really wanna hear from a lot of the folks that have been involved. But what, is, what are we talking about? That is the oyster industry. And the oysters industry impact in the state of Texas and up and down the Texas coast. What a lot of people don't know is through the years, a lot of the oyster reefs, the oyster areas have been impacted by weather environmental impacts. And so a lot of the folks in conservation restaurants in the area of the state agencies were looking at how do we revitalize the oyster industry? And so in the last legislative session, we introduced a bill, HB 1300. And I want everybody to know, I was glad to be the author, but it was a team bill. Senate, House, all sorts of helpers up and down the coast, folks all through the process, very, very supportive. So what do I wanna tell you? Look, this is a new Texas industry. It's gonna create more jobs in, in the entire region. It's gonna increase demand for local seafood. And you know, it's gonna make the Texas coast even stronger as a cultural and tourist destination. Now on the phone and on the video, we have Texas Parks and Wildlife, we have the General Land Office, and I wanna thank the Governor's Office. They all have been with us through this process. And so you know, Texas Parks and Wildlife recently launched the practice of oyster mariculture in Texas. This provides a great opportunity for economic activity up and down the coast. And this new industry, has the potential to create economic and environmental benefits by allowing us, the people, to lease public waters to grow and harvest 
oysters commercially. And I just want you to know this is a great opportunity for the coast, for those involved in the seafood industry to really make an impact on Texas. And as I say, there is nothing better than bringing back the Texas oyster. And so that's what we're doing today. Our first speaker is a great friend. He, uh, he and uh, his colleagues came to me and talked to me about this particular bill. And I wanna introduce Dr. Joe Fox. Dr. Fox serves as Chair of Marine Resource Development at the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at Great Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. So Dr. Fox, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Representative Hunter. And, uh, and I'd also like to echo your sentiments in terms of thanking everybody that was involved in getting the legislation and, and also the, the regulations set up for this particular industry. Everybody, you know, we have a lot of partners in this, as you mentioned, everybody from TPWD to CCA to Texas Restaurant Association. And what really helped was the formation of your formation of the uh, the uh, Oyster Aquaculture Task Force, as well as the development by TPWD of the of the working group to start on the regulations. But I would also I would be remiss not to also thank uh, the Texas A&M system for uh, uh, enabling a lot of this uh, to get going and also the research that we're undertaking. That includes Chancellor Sharp as well as, as President Miller. And I, 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 I want to thank them wholeheartedly for their support of all of this. Uh, without their help, I, I don't know how far along we would be in all of this. Uh, you know, last uh, summer we had the uh, uh, Oyster Aquaculture summer, Summit here on on campus at TAMU CC, and, and so that's more than a year ongoing. But I can tell you that uh, our role here as a Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies, we've been very active in, you know, working on developing this industry and, and doing some of the, the research that's really required to, to make it happen. It's also, it's not only scientific research, but it's research and and, and looking fund for funding in the area of economic development, uh, supporting the, this new industry. Our, our primary uh, uh, modus operandi in all of this is to provide, and, and it's part of our mission statement, science-based solutions to help you know, uh, develop industries such as this so that, that uh, they develop in a sustainable manner so that we could provide oysters for the supply side and retail sectors, which are sometimes very much lacking. So my objective here is to give you a sort of a, an update, uh, the HRI update on, on some of the projects that we have going on. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the first projects that I want to talk about, and, and I, I would like to emphasize that our research effort throughout the pan pandemic that we're in and also the onslaught of hurricanes uh, has not diminished. In fact, it's actually, uh, it hasn't been curtailed, it's actually been uh, expanded upon. And, and so here's what we're up to, uh, what we've been doing. One of the first programs is this uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife funded uh, Federal Fisheries Disaster Relief Program. And that is to establish a, uh, um, a semi-commercial or pilot scale oyster farm in Matagorda Bay. It's actually in Trace Palacios Bay with the intent of operating it uh, as an actual oyster farm. It doesn't do much good to talk and talk about oysters and, and oyster farming unless you have something to show people. And that's what the objective was here. And so we, we uh, uh, about uh, a little less than or a little more than a year and a half ago uh, decided to extend our scientific permit into Matagorda Bay and we've established a, uh, a pilot scale operation there with two with 200 oyster cages. It's situated out in front of the Marine Education Center in Palacios and we're we're doing basically everything that an, an actual oyster farm uh, commercial operation would be doing. 
and then more uh, are, are more so. We're looking at big issues, issues that you would face in managing an, uh, a farm, such as biofouling, water quality, presence of disease, and, and we're looking at other things such as substrate issues in terms of essential marine habitat. Uh, the, the interesting thing about it is that we've been in operation about two and a half months, uh, and with the help of Texas Parks and Wildlife and, and some uh, uh, modifications uh, to the permitting, we've been allowed to bring in seed oysters uh, uh, from other hatcheries in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, that were raised on rootstock from both Copano Bay and Matagorda Bay. Uh, so we have these spawned at Auburn's, Auburn University Shellfish Lab and as well as a, a commercial hatchery in Alabama. We received those seed oysters, uh, you know, as early as June 10th, or as late as, as uh, July 21st from these two groups. And I can tell you right now, after having been in operation for about two and a half months, um, you know, on the farm itself, uh, these oysters are well over an inch in length, and some of them are up to an inch and three quarters in length with really good survival, and we have almost all the cages stocked there. So if you want an answer to the question whether you can grow oysters by aquaculture in the state of Texas, the answer is a, a definite yes, and we should be harvesting some of our first oysters in early November, which is really phenomenal growth, and so it looks very promising. Another project that we have that we're working on, which is Texas Sea Grant funded project for two years, is developing what we call a siding or siding models for oyster aquaculture in, in Copano Bay. We're using Copano Bay as a model bay. And basically what we would do, what we will wind up with is a heat map of the bay indicating areas that, that uh, have high probability for success in oyster farming. But the, the real twist to all of this is that we're also introducing a capacity in there that will uh, indicate to people to grow those oysters, how much capacity can these different locations have in terms of production. Another uh, operation that we have, uh, the, the second farm that we're operating is a real small re research scale uh, uh, project that's funded by the Ed Rashal Foundation in Copano Bay. In this, this is, is largely a uh, master's level or PhD level research uh, um, scenario uh, uh, for looking at things such as biofouling and the impact of oyster farming on, on the local bays in terms of, you know, uh, influence on the environment. We're looking at biofouling and sedimentation and impacts such as that. This farm is also being used to integrate into uh, uh, the uh, siting project that I just mentioned. So it is a model model uh, uh, farm that's used for inputs and outputs to feed into those particular into that particular set of research. I would also be remiss by uh, not mentioning some of the oyster reef restoration work that, that Dr. Jenny Pollock and Gail Sutton are doing in, in local bays and estuaries. And so uh, they've recently received funding to expand some of the restoration work in St. Charles Bay, uh, which is currently at about the uh, uh, 14 acres, uh, uh, 14 acre level that's going to be expanded out even further. And uh, um, this is a, a site that is in, re in restricted waters, but it is also very applicable to anybody who is interested in doing oyster reef restoration. One of the things that we do in oyster aquaculture is perhaps provide eyed larvae to the startup of restoration reefs and maintenance of existing reefs. Their sec second project has a lot of relevance in terms of oyster aquaculture oyster farming and that they are looking at different types of oyster shell bags and materials because if you just lay down plastic bags eventually those it takes a long time for those bags to biodegrade if you use biodegradable mesh in these bags say if you're if you're growing oysters in bags in any way and and putting them out in the environment eventually those oysters establish themselves so this project is to look at 
biodegradable meshes that will go away and won't persist in the environment for very long. The uh, next thing that I want to talk about are the larger scale projects that involve hatcheries. As everybody knows, you're not going to have much of an oyster aquaculture industry unless you um, you have a hatchery, a local hatchery for the operators uh, to obtain what we call seed or small oysters from. And so we're we're working on finalizing the uh, establishment of what we call the Texas Oyster Resource and Recovery Center. And some of you might have heard me speak of this before, but this is a long-term uh, uh, funding, uh, uh, Restore Act funded project that was originally scheduled for Palacios, Texas. Well, in conference with PCQ and the, and the uh, federal treasury, we've decided to move that to the Corpus Christi area to the North Beach area. And the emphasis of this particular project will be on workforce development. It would certainly help jumpstart the industry in Texas if you had a trained workforce that could work in, in both hatcheries and on the farm. And that is what uh, this particular project is, is, is involved with. We're partnering in on this project with uh, the Ed Rochelle Foundation, which would be constructing the facility. We would be operating the facility with Restore Act funding. The second major project that we have, is, and it's a fairly new development, is what we call the Palacios Marine Agricultural Research Center. And that would be in the place in that in the Marine Education Center in Palacios, that original site. And so we've already we've started working on that, and uh, um, we've started working on that uh, uh, fairly recently. And this is a joint uh, um, sort of project with the Ed Rochelle Foundation. In order to do that, what has been formed is known as an agricultural research organization that would. Uh, allow us to receive funding from a lot of different sources. This is sort of a USDA designation, but the objective of this uh, particular operation is to establish a hatchery, which Texas uh, desperately needs uh, to provide a lot of different oyster products, not only for reef restoration, such as eyed larvae or spat on shell, but also production of seed oysters that would provide uh, you know, operators of farms and, and nursery operations in the state of Texas with seed oysters. We're a, at this point, we're currently applying for permits. Uh, we've started renovations on the facilities and we're purchasing equipment to get it outfitted. Uh, the capacity of this facility would be at least 200 million uh, larvae per year. Uh, but it would have the ability to expand up to 500 or 600 million larvae per year. That doesn't mean seed oysters. So uh, we would probably in, be in the range of 50 to 60 million seed oysters at least per year uh, out of this particular operation. And everybody wants to know when will this be functioning. And that would be uh, probably, I would say, in late spring, early summer, more likely early summer so that we could get a spawn out of uh, out and available to people by early summer. So uh, other items, some of these are, are sort of shared uh, items uh, and largely with with uh, the one I want to mention now is with Texas Sea Grant. So we're, I, I believe that Mario Marquez is going to address this particular issue, so I won't go into detail, but you know, in combination with what Parks and Wildlife is doing to develop uh, guidance on the permitting process and developing their a website to to this effect, we at uh, HRI and 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 with uh, largely with you know under under the responsibility of Texas Sea Grant are developing an informative web page that will assist farmers in making decisions and guidance in terms of of the farming. The last thing that I want to mention in my 10 minutes here is uh, future research items that we will likely be working on here at, at the Heart Research Institute. And one of those is development of triploid oysters for Texas. We're under a mandate from the uh, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Commission to get going with developing our own line of what we call tetraploid oysters that we would make with local 
what we call diploid oysters to develop lines of triploid oysters here for the state of Texas. This would circumvent some of the issues that, that we typically have in warmer months with the, the quality of oysters. And if you're going to have a viable industry, you need, Texas needs to have its own lines, its own ability to produce triploid oysters that are fat and happy oysters throughout the summer and, and maintain a market presence for Texas. We also uh, will be working on year-round spawning of Texas oysters. Uh, uh, production of oysters by spawning is largely a seasonal thing if you look at the West and East Coast. And you know, one of the things, big research areas that a lot of people are looking at, I think Alabama is looking at this right now, is having the ability to produce oysters year round. If you're gonna have a full-fledged industry, as with other uh, agriculture type industries, you're gonna have to be able to produce year round. So we're, we will be working on that. We will also be working on a big issue uh, associated with potential for Vibrio presence in oyster tissue. And that is um, the period of resubmergence of oysters after desiccation. When you grow oysters in cages, uh, particularly cages, uh, whether they're floating cages or midwater column cages, you have to take them out of the water or you have to desiccate them somehow to maintain control over biofouling. But the big issue is they are out in the hot sun, they grow bacteria. How long do they have to go back in the water before you can harvest them and have a safe product? And every state works on this, so we think we should be working on that also. Finally, uh, relaying of oysters from restricted to approved waters and the time until harvest. Uh, uh, we want to look at that and, and see what the guidelines, there's a guideline, I think, of 120 days on that. We want to work on it. And finally, uh, the use of caged oyster farming for development and maintenance of native oyster reefs. So uh, that's basically my presentation for today. Dr. Fox, appreciate it. Appreciate it. And at, next, I want to introduce one of our speakers, a good friend. He, beginning in 1983, he uh, helped develop and has been a big, strong supporter of revitalization of downtown Corpus Christi with Water Street Restaurants. 2005, he took his love and founded the Texas Surf Museum. Uh, he has a great deep appreciation for the Gulf of Mexico and its natural resources. He's been a big supporter of the Grow Texas movement. He's a great entrepreneur and leader. And that's Mr. Brad Lomax. Brad. You all hear me? Got me now? Good afternoon. Um, a couple of things. Hey, First of all, I would really appreciate if y'all would keep the state of Alabama in your thoughts and prayers right now. For real, right down there where our baby oysters are, uh, they took a direct hit from Sally. And I've had some correspondence and from Beth at Oyster South, um, you know, they, it was a cat two at arrival. We all know what that's like. We all know what they're facing. And uh, those people have been an enormous selfless help to Texas in getting this industry started. So we need to help them however we can in the coming days and weeks. Um, I, I really want to thank you, Representative Hunter, and a lot of you on this call. Um, for what we've accomplished in the last two years. We've accomplished a lot in the last two years, both legislatively and in on the regulatory side. But I can tell you from firsthand experience, um, we've got a long way to go. We have a significant learning curve. Th those of us who want to be farmers have a significant learning curve ahead of us there's thing before we will have texas oysters in cages growing in texas bays for profit commercially um we've got a lot to learn so i am going with with that in mind to that end um 
I'm going to cede the rest of my time to a young man named Mario Marquez. And I, I'm really, I have not shaken Mario's hand yet. We've had discussions. And if you read his bio on a, a Texas Sea Grant website, we're, we've got a great one to uh, facilitate. To, uh, you know, the way I look at it, Mario, you're a midwife, man. You are going to help us birth this industry and and take it to the commercial side and help us nurture it and grow it in the coming years. Very qualified. You can read his bio online. Um, he's not a PhD yet, but I look forward to calling you Dr. Mario soon. So Mario, take it from there, please. Well, thanks. Please let me share my... Give me a second. I apologize for that. So, as Brad was saying, um, can I see that? Um, well, Brad, you should is... probably mute. Brad, you should mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I'm the new Texas oyster aquaculture specialist for uh, for Texas, and obviously we're the we're one of the last uh, coastal states to get oyster aquaculture. But it's actually it actually benefits us be, because we can learn from other people's mistakes. And before I was the oyster aquaculture specialist for Texas in my previous life, I was a small um, oyster aquaculture farmer in Florida, and. I well as uh, doing my doctoral work in oyster aquaculture. So I don't know much, I don't know everything, but I'm willing to try to help you guys through it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about oyster farming from the farmer's perspective. Um, and the thing that I really wanna talk about is the fact that it is a, it's a very different industry from wild oyster harvesting. Um, what we do is we get the seed from babies, um, like, like Joe was saying, and we actually, the oyster farmer takes care of them. A lot of animal husbandry goes, um, from growing the seed, a lot of maintenance to getting, getting you a nice premium oyster. So the thing is that it's very much like a new, uh, it's, it's a niche market. Uh, it's already established pretty well in the Gulf of Mexico and obviously in the East coast. But the thing is that the people are looking for uh, they're looking for that premium half shell market. They're looking for the oyster, the nice oyster that you can eat on a half shell. Uh, it's very much kind of like the boom in microbreweries. Um, you know, people want a good beer, just like they want a good oyster. Sometimes they go together. And that's where I really want to show the farmer. It's just totally a different industry with different techniques. Um, <clears throat> for the farmer, one of the things I really want to talk about because right now we're in the phase of permitting, obviously on September 1st, 2020, Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, we passed it and it's a law now. So uh, we they really need to know the rules and regulations, which are obviously online, um, chapter 58 of the Texas Administrative Code. And this, if you read it through, read it forwards, backwards, any way, which, which way you get it, um, it will answer some of your questions. And what you don't know, in oyster aquaculture can essentially hurt you, it can hurt your wallet, and it can essentially hurt the consumer. And it can actually shut down, um, it can really affect the industry. Uh, obviously, Texas Parks and Wildlife is spearheading it, but there are different agencies that are um, that are also involved. Uh, for example, at Texas General Land Office, they're the ones that give you your, your land permit, and then you have to look at environmental quality because you're talking about wastewater and water rights and obviously in texas health services because it's remember that we are serving a raw we are serving raw food um so the second most important thing is location 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 um texas has hundreds of vast miles of beautiful uh, of beautiful water but the thing is that you cannot bend your, you have to bend to the will of the oyster. Um, you cannot, if it's something beautiful, but it, you, something can be gorgeous, but um, it might not be productive for oyster farming. So your location must be in an area that can grow um, oysters. And obviously you can contact different agencies uh, for guidance, such as Texas Parks and Wildlife. And, and for example, us in Texas Sea Grant, 
But there's an important thing to do before you even start. It's uh, go out and there's a lot of due diligence. Go look at the area. Um, obviously, the depth, um, if you can grow oysters, look at the environment. Does that seagrass? And first and foremost, um, look at the legality, the legalities of it. Um, it um, it's a, to see if you can actually legally, if it's legally permitted. And then after that, um, the location will dictate the type of off-water farming that you will be doing. For example, you can see the, the gentleman, he's doing um, Australian longline, the adjustable longline system because he's in a shallow area. <clears throat> so in the Gulf of Mexico, they focus on three types of gear, adjustable long line, floating cages, and the floating bag. Um, so the adjustable long line, it's on a fixed line, and it's really for the Goldilocks lease, uh, at least in Florida, they call it the Goldilocks lease. It's not too deep, it's not too shallow, it's just right. Um, they're for relatively shallow and firm bottoms, and the thing is that since they're on a fixed line, it'll allow your oysters to desiccate daily. Um, but the thing is that it's sometimes more expensive because there more, there's more infrastructure involved in building these leases. As opposed to floating cage and the floating bag, um, as you can see on the bottom photo, um, these, they, you can essentially use them at any depth, but they're usually for deeper leases. The thing about them is that they're stackable uh, you can stack different uh, bags in there. Um, so it allows you to grow more oysters per square foot. And they're always submerged. These oysters, they're not like the Australian long line that are desiccated daily. They are always submerged. So, so the oysters are always feeding on um, an algae. But the thing is for biofouling, you will have to manually flip the oysters weekly um, to allow them to dry out and kill the biofowl and really help shape a nice pretty oyster. So it's a, lot, a little bit more involved um not much more but slightly more and then there's the floating bag which is very similar to the floating cage similar um it's it, you cannot stack them so there's less density per cubic foot when you're talking about your lease size and it's uh relatively less expensive for infrastructure and cost for supplies um but one of the things i would say is start, start small um, obviously it's texas so we want everything uh to big fast uh so one of the things I've actually seen is um, oysters getting in, oyster farmers getting in over their heads. Um, there's an extremely steep learning curve and a lot of practice that goes into growing these beautiful boutique oysters that you want to present and be proud of on the on the half shell. And I promise you, you will kill thousands of oysters. Uh, I've heard people say that you're not a true oyster farmer until you've killed about a million oysters. So that's just one of the things for an, uh, an oyster farmer to see and you will respect the work. Uh, it's slow and steady, obviously. Um, yeah, and get a farm that you can realistically maintain. <clears throat> Don't uh, obviously there's no min or max. Well, an acre plus what, however large you want an acre for Texas Parks and Wildlife. But um, you really want something that you can realistically maintain, especially when you're starting out and slowly grow your company. Um, and as Joe was saying earlier, uh, we're building uh, hatcheries essentially here, but once one thing you want to do is you want to contact your suppliers and your hatcheries uh, early to basically um, to get your to get your seed in. And a lot of times they have um, they already have their quotas filled before the oysters are actually uh, mature enough to go in to be sold to the farmer. And then lastly is the branding. Um, it's a little bit different from wild oysters. Um, you have to stand out from the others. And these are some these are some um, companies that are out, out in the Gulf of Mexico um, because the consumer wants to hear your story, um, what you really want to use. And it's great because we have a technology for it. And whenever farmers go out, everyone has their smartphone on them. So use uh, social media platforms, uh, um, use them consistently, record yourself out there because people want to hear your story. You want to separate yourself from them. You use Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and farmers are your friends. You want to collaborate with the other farmers. It's essentially a whole community out there. And you can learn from them. Um, it helps for advertising, uh, for information and ideas. You, uh, one thing I've seen in the Gulf of Mexico is you get 50 different farmers in a, in, in, in a room and you have 50 different ideas and techniques for doing it. So that's one thing um, I highly recommend. And one of the um, nonprofit consortiums that's out there right now in the Southeast region from North Carolina, now all the way to Texas is Oyster South. 
And what they do is that they actually get together farmers, growers, restaurants, suppliers, distributors, and they have meetings and you just jumble ideas um, back and forth. And it's really, it's a really good network um, to do because um, you learn, you learn from your mistakes, but it's also good to learn from people that have been doing it before. Um, and lastly, one of the things that um, Texas Sea Grant's doing is we're actually developing, it hasn't launched yet, a Texas Oyster Mariculture website. Um, because you have to go through different agencies and this and that. We essentially want to make it easy for farmers. Um, when I was a farmer, I really didn't have this luxury. But we wanted to make it a one-stop shop for all your information. Uh, we'll have industry information, guides, webinars, trainings, different techniques for the different grout you'll use, uh, supplier contacts, and even just contacts for different agencies. Um, essentially, I am a liaison right now for um, for the oyster industry. And... Um, I can help you contact. Um, I can help you contact uh, the right people and actually go out to your farm and help you survey. And essentially, I just want to make this uh, as successful as possible um, and just make this really work in Texas. We have such good waters. Um, I really want to uh, make our state proud. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you a lot. And our next speaker is going to be Dacus Geislin, who serves as Chief of the Science and Policy Resources Branch in the Coastal Fisheries Division of Texas Parks and Wildlife. Dacus, go forward. Thank you, Representative Hunter. Everybody, uh, everybody, hear me all right? You know, get a thumbs up. There we go. Perfect. Well, I, I know you, you all are, this group especially, is, is used to seeing uh, Lance Robinson's uh, baseball card size picture up on your screen. Well, Lance, Lance departed from the department, and our longtime colleague and friend is sailing the, the calm seas of retirement. So um, it looks like it's, it's up to us other folks uh, in the department to carry, carry the torch and carry that legacy. Um, just real quick, as Representative Hunter mentioned earlier, you know this is this has been a, a a team effort, and through the legislative process, through the through the program development process, and I know several of our folks are uh, here on the line today, uh, and we may call on them if we need to. But I just wanted to take some time today, joining you all, um, and and share some of those highlights of our program program milestones relative to the permitting process. Um, if, and I'm hopeful most of you have, have explored our uh, Texas Com, Texas Commercial Oyster Mariculture website that was, went live about a week before September 1st. So really, that's been uh, that's been out on the interwebs for a little more than three weeks. Um, and that that is an incredible resource that our team has put together over the last year. Uh, complete with um, application forms, and within that application form, there, there's a, a wealth and library of, of resources, including, you know, uh, permit application instructions, um, a permit checklist, uh, contacts from various other permitting agencies that prospective applicants will will need to work with to obtain those permits from those respective agencies. Uh, I guess the biggest part of that application is is the operation plan, and I we, we'd love to hear some feedback about you know what folks think about that operation plan because it's really not only is it kind of a guidance, but it's it, it there it we we attempted to develop a model to kind of walk the applicant through what would what were the essential components needed for a successful operation plan through the permitting process. We also uh, Within that application, it's also a substantial portion of the of the resource for the natural resources survey. Um, so again, I'd like to you know take this opportunity in the future to um, you know get some feedback from the end user from the prospective applicants as well. Um, also within that within that website, uh, we we really racked our brains throughout the last year and came up with a very exhaustive, essentially a library of potential issues and questions that may arise from prospective applicants and, and general public as well. Uh, and those those live within our, our frequently asked questions there on our website. Uh, a couple of the more new um, technologically based uh, platforms, uh, and if 
any of you have, have worked on the on the spatial analysis, you pro certainly cross paths with uh, Emma Clarkson and our, our team leader for our habitat assessment team. Uh, but the, the Texas Commercial Oyster Mariculture Viewer, uh, that's a map, map based um, application that will show you where facilities uh, are located along the Texas coast. Um, users will be able to review both proposed and permitted um, commercial locations for seed, nursery, and grow out facilities. Uh, there's also an interactive mapper with various layers, including uh, shoreline, ship channels, shellfish classification markers, and harvest areas. So you've I encourage you all to uh, take some time and explore those those resources that we currently have on the uh, currently have on the website. I also wanted to kind of um, share some news that we recently secured a grant from the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, to allow us to really leverage grant funds to increase our position in a queue within the department. What the department is doing is is creating a, a permitting portal. So if, if you folks have conducted research in the past, you may have had to get a scientific collection uh, permit, managed lands deer permit. The, the department oversees many, many different types of permits. And so we felt there, uh, we saw a real need to create a, a permitting portal uh, that was really streamlined the permitting process from, from multiple users coming through the department for permits and so all the agency permits will be available on this portal and at some point uh, the texas com permitting site will move over to that permitting portal and what we've done is we've we've worked with the gulf states marine fisheries commission to secure a grant that we can use um, to to contract with an outside vendor uh, a contractor to develop that that portal and increase our, our priority within the queue. Otherwise, this is all being built within our internal uh, internal uh, information technology division. So what that'll do, it'll leverage some, some outside help in the form of a contractor to really get that permit portal um, up and running and out to you all a little faster. But in the meantime, uh, we're using our, our Texas Com website to deal with, uh, to deal with a lot of that. Um, I did want to hit on some of the uh, the permitting uh, processes that we've already undergone. Uh, I know many of you have had consultations and have got the pleasure to work with some of our team members. Uh, I can tell you now, and these are numbers that Emma has provided me within the last week, that we've been working with approximately five applicants to navigate the application and permitting process. Uh, and we've been meeting with, with folks, including the likes of some of you on on the call today, uh, weekly and biweekly, to kind of help refine site selection and just just be there for for you all to answer questions as we start thinking about uh, the siting and the concerns and permitting uh, constraints that that we have to take into consideration. There, we're also um, serving as uh, you know discussing some of the site considerations that that than other permitting agencies. Now, certainly we don't have the authority to uh, regulate uh, their what falls under their jurisdiction, but we've been we've been consulting with the likes of the GLO and the Corps of Engineers for uh, ever since the infancy of this program. So I feel like we are, we've done a done our due diligence so we can provide applicants really some of the the guidance on issues that may. May, that you may see in other other permitting um, efforts through through the other agencies. So, um, and, and for for example, just for example, we uh, we communicate regular with regularly with our our colleagues at the GLO, their buffers, and uh, have informed have been informed that they require a thousand foot buffer for oil and gas infrastructure. And while while some of these will be reviewed on a case by case basis, we include. Uh, oil and gas infrastructure on our site review so that we can give give you all the applicants and prospectors in the industry of uh, where their where your proposed site may be too too close to a pipeline or well and uh, we also suggest that you coordinate that with the uh, with the GLO as well and we've just worked to develop some of those triggers so we can we can hope to minimize some of the frustrations because we recognize 
we recognize this is a very onerous and, and multi-layered permitting process. And, and just, just believe in us that we're working to uh, streamline that process as well. And I think it'll just take a little time. Uh, and once we uh, see some of those permit applications come through and we start coordinating um, with our with our partner agencies to really really kind of learn the the permitting permitting side of the house for this uh, exciting uh, industry. So with that, I think I'll uh, cede the rest of my time to uh, some of the some of the folks on re left on the agenda. I know Shane. This is a great segue uh, for Shane Bono over at CCA. Um, I think he's talking about some of the restoration work, and that's something we're very uh, we're very proud of as well. We're uh, just to kind of plug some of our restoration, we just finished a 30-acre restoration uh, there in the coastal bend in Grass Island in Aransas Bay that we've already seen some some uh, record of spat set. We saw some pictures this last week of spat set on that restoration site. We have a couple other um, sites located in Matagorda and Galveston Bay um, that we'll be restoring as well. So I just want to kind of provide that segue for Shane. So uh, thank you all for attending today and be sure if within that uh, program, that application, permitting application, each base system has a point of contact. So I also encourage you to reach out to those uh, contacts as a resource and we've built that we feel like we've built the uh, the permitting platform and the application and the website and it's kind of like the, the old field of dreams uh, adage we're we built it now we're waiting for them to come so we're anxious to see uh, some of those pub some of those applications come through the door with thank, that I'll, I'll turn thank it over. Thank you Doc, Doc and I appreciate it and you're right uh, you've all done a good job and we really appreciate working with you David Robin the whole list thank you. And now, everybody, I'm going to introduce Shane Bono, who's the Advocacy Director for our Coastal Conservation Association, CCA Texas. He works with, very closely with the CCA committees, members, and staffs around the entire state, but he's been a real good friend of the coastline. So, Shane, we turn it over to you. Thank you, Representative Hunter. I appreciate that, and thank you, Dacus, for the for the segue there. Yeah, CCA Texas is is involved in habitat restoration all up and down the state, and we're really excited about about oyster mariculture and some of the advancements that that's going to uh, provide us for oyster reef restoration habitat projects. You know, to date we've. We've completed, we're almost to $10 million in habitat projects since 2009, and a large chunk of those funds have gone to oyster reef restoration. And I think collectively, you know, those on the call, those in the, in the, here attending the symposium and CCA members collectively understand the value of oysters to our coastal ecosystems and the role that those reefs play in those ecosystems, you know, providing food and habitat and refuge for aquatic species, for helping to stabilize shorelines and reduce erosion. So all those things that the oysters do naturally on reefs, they're gonna be doing those same things in, in cages and, and in these containment systems that we'll have up and down the coast. So we're excited about that. And, and honestly, as a recreational angler, I'm excited to see more structure go into the water because that's gonna mean better fishing for, for me. Now, um, Mario and Dr. Fox kind of talked about this with regards to oyster mariculture. You know, what a what a farmer puts into it is what he's going to get out of it, where he decides to grow these oysters, how he decides to grow them. All of those things are going to determine the, the end product that they get. So we're really excited about this niche market, this boutique industry that can result from uh, productive farming practices. And we're going to be communicating that with our membership. You know, there's a good opportunity here to do a lot of public outreach and a lot of education amongst the 70 plus thousand recreational anglers and CCA members that we have across the state. So we're excited about that. Now, with regards to restoration, you know, restoration can occur in many different shapes and sizes and forms. These projects that you do with oyster restoration how you structure the project depends on what you want to get out of it. You know, what's, 
is the intent to allow commercial harvest. Well, if that's the intent, then you're going to put out uh, substrate loosely on the bottom so that uh, a reef can be reestablished and it's easy for a commercial dredger to come back and, and dredge that product when it's when it becomes market size. If that's the intent of your restoration project, then you carry it out in that manner. If the intent is to, say, stabilize a shoreline, then you do that differently. You might want to put some more complex, rigid structure that has higher relief off of the bay bottom, something that can't be commercially harvested, or you do it in a place that's not legal for commercial harvest. So you, you cater your restoration projects according to what you want to get out of them, what the end result, what you would like that to be. So what Oyster Mariculture does for us with Oyster Reef Restoration, and I don't mean us as CCA Texas, I mean us collectively as a state, it gives us this really neat opportunity to blend those two things together. And so Dr. Fox mentioned it, and I think Mario mentioned it, having that hatchery component is critical. It gives you the chance to do remote setting and put spat on shell or put spat on a reef ball or put spat on whatever structure you want to put in the water, but do that remote setting and have that oyster attached to the reef first, and then you can deploy it wherever you want to conduct your restoration activity. So then once it's deployed, then of course you'll get the bryzoans, you'll get the tunicates, you'll get all the other colonizing organisms that naturally occur in the water. So it's almost like an instant reef that that you can that you can deploy so we're excited about the opportunity that's that's going to give not only cca texas but all of our other conservation partners texas parks and wildlife other ngos and and of course our research institutes uh, across the state so that's really exciting we're looking forward to doing that and let's not forget about the opportunity to to monitor these operations whether it be a restoration reef or a, a farm and I don't mean from a regulatory perspective, which I'll, although that's important, but monitor them from a research perspective and from a best management practices perspective. I think monitoring these operations will help get us further insight into carbon capture associated with oyster mariculture, erosion protection that you see that's resultant of having a farm along a sensitive shoreline, uh, potential adjacent vegetation growth along the bay bottom, and of course, presence and abundance of, of key species such as blue crabs. So all those things are important and they're really unique opportunities for, um, for us to, to engage and, and to incorporate into oyster mariculture and restoration reefs. And finally, um, I, th I think this is a really neat opportunity to engage with the public. And as I mentioned, we're looking forward to doing that with all of our membership, having these farms in the water is going to stimulate the conversation. It's going to get people looking and, and talking and having oysters on the brain, right? They're going to see that cage in the water and they're going to wonder, what, what is that? What is that doing? And as they begin to understand, they say, oh, that's an oyster. That's an oyster farm. You mean you don't have to always dredge the bay bottom to get an oyster product? These things can be grown and they can be grown in a sustainable way. And then perhaps they'll ask, well, how do we how do we help transition the industry from a from a practice that may not be sustainable long term to one that certainly is sustainable long term? So it gets the general public thinking about better ways that we can that we can utilize our base systems to provide food for uh, for us to consume. And with that, I think I'll close out because the next guy coming up uh, has. Spent so much time in the water, I think his waders have oysters growing on them. But I look forward to hearing any time that Bill talks about anything coastal. So I'm going to see the rest of my time to, to Bill by boat. And I thank you, Representative Hunter, for putting this on. Um, thanks thanks to, to Joe Fox for all of his work behind the scenes. And, and you guys stepping out there to be the pioneers in the industry, Brad, Lee Knezic, um, Kudos to you guys and those that are in the back of the bays waiting quietly so nobody steals their spot. Thanks to all you guys that are, are uh, stepping out first to, to be the farmers and the pioneers in this industry. And I got to thank Parks and Wildlife. Uh, those are my people. I spent quite a few years with TPWD and the amount of work that they've had to put into developing this program 
is has been tremendous and uh kudos to those to those guys and uh i'm very proud of the work that they've done thus far so uh, thank you i appreciate it thanks a lot shane we appreciate you and next we're going to have Bill Balboa, Executive Director of Matagorda Bay Foundation. He's going to give an update, and then he's going to be followed by Lee Knezik with the Medco Shellfish Growers Association. So, Bill, take it away. Hello. Can you all hear me? Hello? Yeah, he's shaking. Okay, yes. Okay, good. So, so this is Bill. Um, um, First, I'd like to thank um, Representative Hunter for this opportunity and for spearheading this effort. You know, I'd like to also thank TPWD staff and, and everyone else that was involved in um, making oyster mariculture possible on the Texas coast. I think it's been a long time coming and it's an exciting opportunity for a lot of different user groups out there in the Bay. Um, as far as Shane, um, I don't know. I, I never really wore waders, Shane, when I worked for Parks and Wildlife, so I may have oysters growing on me, but they're not on the waders. So I just thought <laughs> I'd throw that out there. And also, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Jesse Stace, since we do live in Texas. Um, you know, the Matagorda Bay Foundation, we're a relatively new on-the-ground conservation group in Matagorda County. Um, we're dedicated to the wise stewardship of Matagorda Bay and the watersheds that sustain them. And, and uh, much like CCA, you know, and Shane covered it pretty well, we're pretty excited about the opportunity to um, explore the possibilities of using, you know, captively um, spawned and oysters in various and sundry different um, capacities for restoration. As Shane said, you know, in living shorelines or potentially in conservation reefs. And um, so we've been, I've engaged Dr. Fox in these discussions in the past, and um, we're moving forward with those, you know, to to perhaps partner with HRI or other folks to um, research the uh, the advantages and um, the best way to use these these uh, new technologies in the new hatchery and everything to um, help the health of the bays in, in the state of Texas and help the oyster industry and and the oyster resources in Texas. You know, they're as everyone knows, they're hurting from hurricanes, floods, um, and and a wealth of other things, including overfishing. Um, Secondly, we're also really interested in, in, in partnering um, for education and outreach. As Shane also said, you know, this is it's really going to be important to share this new and um, exciting opportunity with the people of the state of Texas. We've been partnering with Baylor University to do some continuing education events for secondary teachers and informal educators here in the Matagorda County area. We've done several over the past few years. and. And we're really looking forward to uh, engaging with Mario Marquez and other folks at uh, the Marine Education Center, or what is it? What is it called now? The Palacios Agricultural Marine Development Center. I think um, on um, partnering in some education and outreach efforts to um, bring the people of the state of Texas current with what's happening with their seafood industry. Um, I'm going to end there because I want to give, I know we're running short on time and I want to give Lee Knezik an opportunity to, um, to speak. So um, once again, thank you everybody um, for making this a reality. It's really exciting and um, I look forward to hearing from everyone again in the near future. Ready? Hello, Lee Knezik, Matagorda County, Midco Shellfish Growers Association, potential farmer here. Uh, going through this application process, uh, 30, I think approximately 30 pages long. The very first part says, note, this application will not be considered unless fully completed and all required forms and documents are submitted. Prior to submitting this application, site consultation with the state agency is recommended. The very first part, if you, if you don't complete it all, what I'm getting at, and I'll have to make some phone calls, is the application will be null and void. There's some sections here on this application and some questions that I cannot fully answer at this time. Uh, right off the bat on the uh, operating plan, it says, please explain the proposed seed stocking activities. Months, months, what months will seeding stocking occur? I don't know. I haven't started. So I do I leave this blank? Do I anticipate it? What do I do? Here's another question. Please provide the expected source of my seed. Well, I have several out of state sources, but if I put one down and I don't use it and I go to the next one, am I null and void? These, these types of questions need to be answered because you're dealing with a state agency that can throw this out or kick it out at any time. 
if I'm not following these strict guidelines? Here's another question. How frequently will you visit tend your site for routine tending maintenance? Well, it's naturally, it's like a farmer. When I see something needs to be tended, I'll be there. I can't say, hey, I'm going to be there Monday morning at 8 o'clock. I'm leaving at 9. Or I'm going to be there Friday. I'm leaving at 1. These type of, of, of questions uh, just, just, just don't appease me. How frequently you visit the site during harvesting periods? Well, I plan on harvesting once I get in production 52 weeks out of the year. So do I put 52 weeks for now, 52 times, once, twice, you know, stuff, stuff like that. And then I get checked on by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Agency says, hey, you're not following your guidelines. You're not following your operating plan. Well, this stuff is going to be changed routinely according to the weather, according to uh, production schedules, maintenance schedules, uh, et cetera. Now it says time of year gear will be deployed. Well, I plan on deploying my gear and pulling it out as needed. If I have harvested some product and I need to move it or if I need to pull it out, et cetera. These are just some of the things that, that I was scanning through. Uh, as far as site location and stuff, I don't have a problem with getting GPS coordinates and, and that. Uh, I can work with uh, other people on that. Some of the other agencies that you've listed, I appreciate you giving me all the, the names and stuff I need to contact if they pertain to the application. Uh, you've made it quite simple with your submission checklist. Uh, and and then, then here you have, when I, when I fill this out, I'm going to go ahead and put my name, but I plan on uh, forming an LLC. Will that have to be changed after that, or, or am I, am I uh, voiding my contract? These are just some of the things that I'm going to clarify before I get started on this. And, uh, and I also want to thank everyone. I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to leave anybody out. To thank everyone that, that made this program happen and initially started uh, four years four years ago. And I personally, personally want to uh, thank Mr. Bill Balboa. Uh, he's been a great mentor of mine in the, in the years past, and he hasn't let me down, and he's kept me going for the last four years, and I, just, I, I think he doesn't get enough appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate uh, the comments, Bill and Lee. Everybody, we're really on the time. Let me just make these closing comments. Uh, Dr. Miller, thank you. We really do appreciate you and Texas A&M Corpus Christi for always being there in the Heart Institute. Uh, I want to talk, tell everybody who spoke, thank you. I also want to just tell everybody who plugged in here, who, who attended. This is great. This shows a lot of coastal strength, and it shows that we've got interest in the oyster oyster business, conservation up and down the coast. I also want everybody to know our local chambers of commerce have been involved and they have publicized. I see Ann from the League of Women Voters Corpus Christi who publicized this. It shows there's a lot of diversity and a lot of groups that are interested. And I also want to thank not only Perks and Wildlife, the General Land Office, uh, the Governor's Office, but the Speaker's Office. Uh, Dennis Bond, who's a coastal representative, he helped us along the way, and his office needs to be thanked as well. But overall, I want to thank everybody who's been involved. And we're going to not stop today. Legislature starts in January. As you could hear from the speakers, we're going to start a program. There's going to be fine-tuning. There's probably going to be ways to improve. And so we're going to keep our coastal task force together in the area of the oysters, mariculture, and we're going to be working up and down the coast. And if you have any ideas, contact the office. Angie has coordinated this, and we want to thank her. And I see that my office is on here. But if you have ideas, let us know. But there's not a lot of time between now and January, so we'll be making a list and taking a look at what we can do to help. The main thing is, this is a great forum. Thanks to all of you. It's a new oyster industry for the Texas coast. And as I started, let's bring back the Texas oyster. So everybody, thanks. Appreciate you attending, and we will contact you soon. Thank you.